All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Amy Anderson, who is over the other side of the country, Naples, Florida. How are you doing, Amy? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Amy is the co-founder of Wild Coffee Marketing. Uh, and what we're going to talk to day about is top marketing mistakes to avoid and why it's always great love love giving people information like this and especially love to be able to show them things that maybe they're maybe they don't know they're doing wrong that they're doing wrong that maybe could help them in the the rest of this year and going into next year uh so uh, amy when it comes to do when it comes to just marketing in general people's approach to marketing are there are there things that people do that sometimes kind of set, set them up for failure, if you like, um, that they could avoid? Absolutely. What we see most commonly is people diving into tactics before they've mm -hmm. developed a strategy, right? I mean, if you really boil marketing down to its, its essence, it's what, who are you talking to and what are you saying and why, right? But if you haven't mm -hmm. figured out who the you is in it, then it's almost like sailing, right? You're one degree off and over a period of time, you'll end up on the wrong continent. <laughs> right. So we find that people are often just sort of diving in and doing things and posting and creating and building, but I haven't really figured out that that fundamental that's so critical to their success. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. No, I found myself on the long continent a few times, but uh, that's a completely <laughs> different story. Um, but yeah, uh, but the interesting thing is nowadays, especially because there are so many tools and so many services out there, is that. A, to your point, it can get really tempting just to dive in immediately and start using these tools or start using these services without, as you say, figuring out um, you know, who your real target customer is. And you can end up spending a lot of money and getting very little results as a, as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Or even understanding where you sit in the market, right? We talk a lot when we take on new clients and engagements about myopia. It's a tendency for the executives in the C-suite to really want to talk about who they are, explain what they do and all of these benefits of what they offer, but really they're not talking about solving the problem. Yeah. And so from a messaging standpoint, where do you sit in the market? What is your brand promise to your target customer, right? And how are you problem solving? You know, when people want to put a quarter inch hole in a block of wood, there's that old story, you know, they're not buying the drill bit, they're buying the hole. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you can talk about your drill and your drill bits and all these things, but ultimately, how does it make the hole in the wood and what are you going to give them for that? So it's really trying to stay away from that myopia and also the, the strategic plan of who, who are you and what are you going to say to whom? And then you can figure out where and then you can actually execute. Right. Yeah, because a lot of people, like, they fall into a couple of traps, uh, you know, just through human nature. The first one is obviously get very excited about what we do, We're very excited about it. And you should just be as excited as I am about it, right? Right. Um, because it's very exciting. And then they don't, don't uh, and then they're, they're kind of baffled when, you know, they, they don't get the excitement coming back at them. Because again, as you said, they become myopic. And the other thing is the tendency to try and go broad. Uh, mm -hmm. And sort of, you know, you go, well, who is your target? Of? Let's really nail down who your target audience is and your target buyer and everything. And they say, well, it's kind of everybody. And you go, no, it's not. It's, it's not, not everybody. everybody. It's even close to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, when you think that what you've done is so excellent, then sure, you're going to think that anybody wants it. I mean, when, when we talk about implementation, too, another thing that's happening right now in this market is authenticity, transparency, mm -hmm. being genuine. I mean, these glossy sort of overproduced materials and sales pitches. And I mean, when we consider for our consulting business, we consider it a job interview that lasts over a long period of time. I'm not pitching you. I'm not selling you. I'm having you get to know me. And do you like me? Do you trust me? Do you value what I have to say? And do I solve a problem? It's not me selling you, right? Not even mm -hmm. value selling makes sense to me anymore because you know, I may think that I offer you value, but that may not be the case on the other side, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's true. And I think one of the things, and I think this is going to have profound impacts on, on marketing going forward. I think uh, pre-pandemic even, even the years, 
people, I think, were getting tired of everything being overly engineered um, so mm -hmm. that there was almost removing the human out of the element completely. I think people are already starting to say, to your point, you know, I want to really understand. I want to know this company or I know these people. I want to know what they stand for. I want to have a bit of connection there. I think the pandemic just accelerated that by a thousand. And now I think people are much more in tune and want want that authenticity, want the transparency and the genuineness. And I think that's where a lot of companies are kind of getting caught. They don't really know how to. It's, it's like that thing. How do I be authentic? Exactly. Or like the, the faux vulnerability, right? Yeah, like yeah. Let, let us expose ourselves in these profound ways and really peel back the onion. You're like, mm. oh no, 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 that's a little too far. You know, yeah. it's almost disingenuous in trying to be vulnerable and that sort of path doesn't work for you either. So it's really sort of striking that balance and it's really just don't go and start naming and building and producing until you've just been with the fundamentals. And then with your positioning in the market, how does it change over time? How does your messaging platform change? How does that evolve? A brand isn't meant to be created and sat on and, and overproduced over time. You know, you really need the discipline to go back and look at the plan and say, you know what, reverse engineer it a little bit. Take a little bit of a retrospective and say what worked here and what didn't. And, and it's not just looking at the data, it's more than that, you know, a little bit more of a holistic approach. And I think the other thing too, Amy, is the, the idea of brand even to begin with is sometimes people just think, oh yeah, well, the brand, that's the logo and the colors and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. And they don't realize that the brand is the totality of your organization. You know, so if you if you've come up with the you know the the messaging that really reflects you, the brand that really reflects you, the whole organization has to articulate that. They have to articulate, I think they have to live it a little yeah. bit too, right? Like, you know, core values are something that we work on with clients and it's something we live by in our firm, right? So everybody, we hire according to those. We we review and manage according to those values because I think that's how you build the brand out of your people too and sort of have some commonality in that. We often find if you go into a C-suite and you ask three executives, tell me what you stand for. Tell me what you do. You know that we get all sorts of the crazy, <laughs> yeah. not crazy, but it's not, it, they're not in alignment. And that's at a senior team with companies revenue of excess 40, $60 million that you don't have alignment there. So that is part of the brand too, is sort of where the executive team sees the company going. Yeah. And, and, and getting back to what you said earlier about the, the strategic, you know, the, the strategic piece and the planning piece and doing all of that is, you know, there's a tendency to skate by that because if you say to if you say to most people, okay, let's let's do a marketing strategy session, right? Yeah, marketing people are like, yeah, cool, let's go. Anybody else is like, oh my god, they kill me now. Yeah, the business <laughs> development teams like there they yeah. are at it again. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly, and I think that's probably part of the reason why that's not done as well as it could be is because it's not it's not explained to all of the different stakeholders and constituent parts that this isn't a, this isn't something that belongs to marketing. This is something that belongs to the whole organization. Yes. And especially, you know, in this environment too, with our, with our clients, we sit in the C-suite, right? And, and the marketing has to have a voice there a lot. We own the customer experience in many ways and customer data and very forward and, um, you know, externally facing social media and press. I mean, it's very important that we're sort of speaking the voice of the company. And then, but if you talk to them about the fact, you know, marketing that they already know is a cost center. And then if you say mm -hmm. we're going to waste budget dollars, if we don't do this work, that'll get their attention really fast. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Ex exactly. And, and what are some of the other, what are some of the other mistakes that people make around marketing? Um, okay. So say they get them, they get the messaging right and do the kind of groundwork when it comes then to the execution part, what are some of the mistakes people make? Trying to be everything to everyone. I think, you know, we find you know, a lot of explaining you know, and we tell people, okay, with web design and UX, like, let's really focus on the journey of the customer. Let's pull back a little bit. Where, where are they coming from and what are they doing and what is their journey and what are those touch points, right? So people just build a website <laughs> or they build products and apps and they're not really taking into account the journey. Um, and we always say there should only be three calls to action above the fold on a website or above the scroll. You know, so just trying to put too much out there to too many people at the same time without thinking through that journey. 
Yeah, no, I think that's a great one. I think for for, for people to make, take note of because it is very tempting because just because you can do it if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that you should do it, but you can do it. You can try and overload the content. You can try and make it as broad as possible. You can put in, try and go, oh, well, I'll put in a call to action for this type of person. But if that type of person comes, I'll have another one here. And before you know it, you've just kind of created a very crazy looking mosaic. Yes. Yes. Or you could have like the 17 section website and allow people yeah. to scroll until their next birthday. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> and really putting yourself, you know, the customer has a problem you're trying to solve. So what yeah. are they looking for and what is their problem and how are you solving that? And how are you making them easy? It's not our job to give them homework. Right. Yeah. And we all know about the attention span of goldfish and stopping yeah. power with scrolling. Like we have to take those usability factors into account and the behaviors of the consumer who's interacting with you. So when did this, when did this all scrolling thing happen? Because yeah, I mean, it's just, it just seems like over the last number of years, it's like, you know, we, we, you know, styles and tastes change, but this incessant scrolling thing, I mean, I just don't get yeah. it. It's like, to your point, so like I only have a certain attention span to scroll down. And if something is continuing after a certain amount of time, I'm just like, where, where am I going? Where's the I end? <laughs> or when, what about when you don't even realize you're doing it? And I'm yeah. on Twitter doom scrolling and I'm like, yeah. I just lost 17 minutes of my life that I yeah. can't get back. Yeah. Doom scrolling, you know, this motion with my finger, like yeah. I think I the strongest index finger of all time <laughs> on one of my hands from scrolling, you know, um, yeah. it's really unbelievable. And I wonder, right. When we're talking about sort of transparency and, and being genuine. I wonder if we're all going to start to pare down a lot of the content too, right? There was a trend with SEO, with power pages and Google algorithms, and we had to have all these keywords and it was just so much. And I wonder if we'll start to simplify things a little yeah, bit. And, and I think, and I think we should, because I think there is, uh, I mean, we all know the value of content marketing, but it has to be quality content. And I think what happened over the last number of years, and especially even during the pandemic, was people suddenly panicked and said, oh, yeah, I need to get out there more and I can't go meet people. So I got to have so let's do more content marketing, but producing rubbish, you know what I mean? Like just stuff for the sake of stuff. And it's all noise. And now it's uh, so I think I think people have to be very careful about what they do. And I do think there will be a trend towards pulling back and doing less, um, but of a higher quality. Right. And I think you need to, again, you have to ask yourself, like, is this valuable? Is this useful? In some cases, is this entertaining? Right. Mm -hmm. And I know that using humor in marketing is very risky in a lot of ways, but I mean, I do think you have to entertain and delight and provide value and just creating gated content. Like something has to be really good to be behind a gate in oh, today's yeah. environment. It's too much that people are giving away with you without you giving yeah. enough value. Yeah, I have that. I tell you, I have that argument um, a, a lot with, with some people who shall remain nameless. Um, but that thing about, yeah, but why don't we gate this? And I just go, why? Why? Look at why? yourself. Like if you come here and it's valuable content and you can't get at it without giving me information and you know why I'm asking for it, I'm asking for it so I can spam the heck out of you. Right. Um, so think about yourself as you go there. You don't do it because you know what the result is going to be, or you have that extra email address that you set up that is for all the ones that you want to get stuff, but you don't want to actually have to be on the receiving end of anything. And yeah, right. I, and just, I, 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 I just, I just never yeah. yeah, I put you in a transactional relationship before you're ready to transact, Yeah. right? If I want to hear from you, I know where to go with uh, subscribe and I'll get, and I find that, you know, consistently HubSpot is a company. I will give them my email address and allow them because the quality is so good of their content for a marketer, you know, for a consulting firm owner, I do get valuable. So I'll let them do it for me sometimes, but I, I and especially if you're trying to offer someone a solution, why are you holding back from them? Well, it's like, well, I have your solution but you have to give me something in order for me to give it to you. It doesn't feel genuine and collaborative to me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In order for me to, in order for me to allow you buy something from me, I'm going to force you to do something first. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And as I said, after you scroll it, for 20 minutes yeah, on my website, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you get to the content, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and to your point is, I mean, there's so much content out there that boy, it's got to be something spectacular. If you're going, if somebody's going to uh, go to the trouble of, uh, 
of filling out a gated form. So I think that's one area I think where people need to be careful of now going forward is if you're going to produce content, like produce good content, right? I mean, put some effort into it. Don't just add to the noise because I think that's, I think that's self-defeating. Well, and I also think it keeps you on top of your game, right? Like, you know, like be able to look at yourself in the mirror when you're publishing and it's really hard, right? We work with financial services companies and software companies and everyone has to be a publisher now. You know, when they went into business, a lot of CEOs and entrepreneurs don't think, well, you know what? I just raised a $10 million round. I have this brilliant financial services solution in this niche, right? And now I have to be a media company on top of it. And, and it's, and it's really tough and, and you can't go dark, right? So you have to be consistent in your social media world. Uh, you do need to communicate with prospects and customers. Um, video is very helpful. So mm-hmm. there, there's a lot that you need to do. And, and you are almost like a media company now when you sell other types of products. Yeah. And I think the other thing on top of that is to uh, that people are very used to having choices and how they consume information right some people may love podcasts you know audio podcasts so that they can listen to in their car some people love video some people still read apparently um and Do you uh, read are you a paper are you a paper book reader or a kindle reader um kind of a mix of both to be honest i'm probably more of a kindle nowadays um but once upon a time but i mean i'll even read on my phone i'll read on books on my phone if i have to I do too, but you know, I'm fickle. So I like to be able to have a choice. So I'll actually get the Kindle version and the audible version. Mm -hmm. And then it has that whisper technology. So I get in the car and I can continue listening to what I was reading. So, um, and I'm a curious person by nature. And so I just like to be consuming information. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm trying to keep from doom scrolling too much on Twitter. (laughs) Yeah. But I think to the point is what you were saying there a a little bit ago is that, uh, so people are used to choices. People consume information differently nowadays. So whether you like it or not, you have to you have to be a media publishing company, and you have to publish media. And you have to publish in different uh, assets in different ways, and give people a choice because otherwise, you're you're not going to capture, you know, the broad spectrum of people. Right, and luckily there are lots of options for that. I have to say, um, I hire journalists for social media and content development. I think they are an incredible storytellers. And so they are able to sort of capture voice, make things interesting, connect with people, and then really understand like different formats and ways Mm -hmm. to do that. So I think that that is sort of an objective from a content perspective too. Like, are you connecting with the consumer of the content and providing them content and formats that works for them? You know, but the good news is, as we know, is that if you produce good good core or raw content, then it becomes a lot easier to turn that into multiple assets, right? Use, you know, create once, use many times. I, I mean, like for instance, what we're doing now, it'll be a video. It'll also be audio podcasts as well um, and probably a little blog post too. So it's not like it has to be, it's not like you have to be producing 10 pieces of content, you know, every day you can be producing, you know, a good piece of content and then just distributing it in multiple ways. Yes, we call it having legs. We get all excited yeah. when we come up with a concept and we say, oh, this has legs, it has yeah. infographic legs, it has video potential legs, it has social posts, it has blog posts, it has website content, um, you know, so that that is really exciting when you do come up with yeah. a good piece that, you know, you can use that way. Yeah. Um, so just a, um, a last quick question. So where do you see marketing going from here? What's the, is there a next big thing coming? Is there a trend emerging uh, or are some of the things that we used to do coming back into vogue? I really think sort of this focus on less glossy, less produced, more authentic, more, more focus on the actual customer needs and less selling you know, and, and just really focusing on doing what you do well. Um, you know, I had a client come the other day and said, Oh, we need, we need taglines. And I was like, taglines, no, Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um, just do it worked for Nike. Right. And it's iconic, but things are moving so quickly. I think you have to be a lot more nimble than that. And I, I think you have to be ready to pivot really quickly. So as these emerging trends and as these, you know, think about how quickly we're in this together went away. Mm -hmm. right we all got locked in our homes and we had this sort of emotional moment where we're like okay we're all in this together and if you did that three weeks later you were sort of late in the curve to that so I think it's it's really paying attention 
because yeah. now we have to consider these sort of macro economic and societal shifts and changes and to be genuine, you know, not capitalize on, on social justice issues for our own marketing purposes. That's not real. You have to be able to walk that talk and be authentic in all of your approaches. So, yeah, no, I, I, t- I totally agree. And that's why I think you should be careful and you should be, you know, mindful and deliberate on the things that you do talk about, because if that's not, it doesn't, that doesn't have to be, you know, all these things don't have to be a part of every company. It can be some companies do. Your company may not, maybe focus on something else. So to your point is don't pretend that's what you are when you're not, but just be, be who you are, uh, be who you are genuinely. And and I think that's a great, I, I think what you said is, is really, really important for people is, is that your marketing is ongoing. Your brand is ongoing. And you have to be ready to pivot. Like it's great. You can come up with a new tagline, but be ready to change it in six months if you have to. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're doing a lot with AI now, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, really focused on digital marketing and optimizing sort of our deployments there. So, you know, AI and trying to figure out ways to work that into our business. So on the opposite end of being authentic and human <laughs> and transparent <laughs> and connecting, we have robots, you know, on that front. So it's it's really sort of a blend of, of those two, like using technology, but not overusing it so that you're not delivering things to your core consumers that aren't relevant to them and don't connect and aren't authentic. Exactly. If it's being because I mean, I've no problem with with um, with bots and all that kind of stuff, as long as they're delivering something to me uh, of value. But if they're not, then obviously I have a problem with them. And I also have kind of have a problem when people, you know, pretend that they're not bots because I'm like, come on, just be honest about it. I mean, if it's if it's a bot and it delivers value to me, I'm fine with it being a bot. But don't pretend it's right. not a bot. Or the bot should do a little bit of homework on me before yeah. the bot reaches out to me. Exactly. I'll be like, oh, that's a cool bot because that bot figured out who I was and what I do and what I like. So I'll take it, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. So we're not anti-bots at all. I mean, bots no. are great, but just like make sure they deliver value and make sure you're just honest that they're bots. You know, so exactly. Be, exactly. <laughs> it's like, it just is an aside finishing. It's like, you know, in, in previous work, you know, sometimes doing sales consulting with large organizations and they'd say, oh, we don't call our we don't call our salespeople salespeople. We call them whatever. They have some convoluted title, and I always go, "Oh, that's fine." Yeah, I go, "But you do know that your prospects know their salespeople." Yeah, <laughs> 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 I mean, you're not fooling anyone. <laughs> No, oh, that's interesting. Like field, field advocates, you know. Yeah, or something. Yeah, there's there's all, all sorts of crazy titles. To it. Just, just get away from being a salesperson. I say, yeah, it's fantastic, but just, just so you know, they know you're a salesperson, right? Has anybody, uh, has any salesperson ever come to you with a different title and you've gone, wow, that was a shocker. I didn't realize he was a salesperson. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I knew what he was doing. I knew exactly. what he was doing there. <laughs> All it. right. Well, listen, this has been great, Amy. I'm glad we have uh, c- got time to chat. Uh, all of Amy's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, do, do please tell us a little bit more about you and uh, your company. Sure. Now I'm a 30 year marketing executive who is uh, decided to go out on my own with my business partner about four years ago. And, and we offer fully outsourced marketing teams and CMOs to clients. So we're passionate about helping them grow and do really good work. And we have long-term engagements that um, are super fruitful uh, for our clients because we dig in there and get a lot of great work done. So, um, and we've been at this for about four and a half years and are really enjoying it. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I would encourage people to reach out and have a look at uh, what Wild Coffee Marketing does. It's it's a complicated world out there and it's marketing is com- is getting more and more complicated. And in some ways, if you don't have the expertise in-house and very few people do, I, I really encourage you work or with- Or you need a team of 17, right? To get it all done. And then the overhead is so tremendous because yeah. the experience that you need is so specific now. So we're, yeah. we're hoping to solve for that and help people who not have to carry that, um, that sort of overhead in-house. Yeah, and that was just the point. Actually, I'm glad you raised that because that, that is the essence of it. Just that there are so many specific things. Like, I mean, you could hire somebody tomorrow just to do Google Tag Manager for you, right? Because you this need, is correct. But but there wouldn't be. But you you're unlikely to have full time work for that person. Correct. Therefore, um, you know, working with consultants, working with fractional people, working with, you know, variable resources. I mean, it makes so much sense. I, I sense because I do think the future of organizations is hybrid, not just hybrid in terms of physical and, and virtual, but also hybrid in terms of 
full-time employees and variable resources. And sometimes those resources will work for you for a long time and they'll be almost like their employees. Well, we, it's you know. seamless in a lot of, we go to executive yeah. meetings. We, you know, I presented to a client's investor the other day, sort of as the CMO. I mean, he knows mm-hmm. that I'm not a full-time employee, but it, that's not the experience you have. And it really yeah. depends on sort of how you approach it, right? But yeah, even absolutely. if you had three people in a company that did 10 million, they're still going to have to hire a whole yeah. suite of other people and then things start to get really disjointed when at least you have your fractional resources under one roof at least there's cohesion right yeah and then that gets back to just having that strategy you know Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm I'm all in favor and I would encourage it. So I would encourage people to go check out Wild Coffee Marketing. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Amy. Thank you for watching, listening, and I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.